Greetings to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and welcome to Bible in a Year, Day 31. This is our last day in January, and we'll have completed one of the 12 months for the Bible plan this year. Give yourself a pat on the back. Get yourself a milkshake. Glory be to God. We are doing good. I want to say thank you to everyone that is contributing to the discussions, that's uh, commenting with their reflections. Uh, it is appreciated. Listen, when we're doing this, when we're talking about what we're reading about concerning the Word of God, we are ingraining into our hearts deeper and deeper the concepts of God's Word. We are meditating on the Scriptures. And as the Bible has told us in Psalm chapter 1, we will be like trees planted by the rivers of water whose leaf will not wither, but we will bear our fruit in our season. And to the Lord be all the glory, because it is His desire for every one of us to be fruitful. If you're just joining this Bible reading endeavor, welcome. Just join in right here, day 31. Don't worry so much about going back to the beginning and trying to catch up, unless you feel the grace to do so and you have the discipline to carry you. I commend you and I say, go on, brother. Go on, sister, get that word in you. However, don't feel pressured or obligated to do so. You are more than welcome to join in right here. We are traversing through the book of Job. I say traversing a lot, don't I? I like that word. It kind of makes me feel like I'm surfing through the scriptures. You know what I mean? traversing, surfing, maybe because it rhymes. I don't know, but I am having a good time and you all are sharpening me. That's what I love about this because there is no way. I don't know everything there is to know about the Bible. In fact, the more I learn, the more I realize I have so much more to learn and I have learned much from you all. If I have not responded or acknowledged your comment here lately, I would implore your forgiveness. I have not been feeling 100%, and it has been a tremendous effort to push through. However, today I am feeling uh, a lot better, not 100%, but glory be to God, I have been strengthened. And I thank you heartily for all of your prayers and intercessions for every one of you that's mentioned my name to the Father in petition on my behalf. God bless you and may the Lord reward you richly for your kindness towards me and my family. Let's dive right into the Word of God. I want to highlight here in the book of Psalms some dark, devastating verses that would probably be fresh to reflect upon in light of my recent experiences over here in VA. Praise God. So, Psalm chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. The book wasn't a very long read. We only read, what, verses 1 through 6. And I particularly don't like the way that it's broken up like that halfway through the chapter, halfway through the book. However, there isn't anything that I can do about that now. We're going to continue trucking right along. We'll just deal with it and see how we can uh, accommodate for that later on, maybe next year when we do this again. So Psalm chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. Now, I am reading from the King James Version of the Bible, King Jimmy over here. Don't try to take King Jimmy, y'all. <laughs> Psych, I took it from somebody else. So it's all good. <laughs> Praise God. Or you can follow along with whatever version you have that you're comfortable with. A third option would be to just simply listen to me dictate to you from the old English. I promise I'll try to make it worth your while. See, that's the German coming out. Every time I hang out with my grandmother, I pick up her accent. Other than that, I'm good. I'm chilling. Everything is smooth. And then I hang out with my grandmother and I pick up her German accent. <laughs> Praise God. She's about to be healed. 
Verse number four, the sorrows of death <laughs> compassed me, surrounded me, rolled up on me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. People have struck fear in my heart. A lot of people. David said, the floods of ungodly men. A flood is a mass quantity of water, more so than is probably desired by very implication of the word flood, overflow. Floods get in the way of things. They go places where they really shouldn't be. Floods bring water into places where there shouldn't be any water. And when you're talking about the floods of ungodly men, now you got people all in your business where really they don't have any business to do or to be. Verse five, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. What a dark, gloomy picture that I draw when I read words like this, especially the choice or combination of words that are combined here and linked together to paint a very vivid, very intentional picture, very dark and dreary imagery, the sorrows of death, as if death is personified here and the sorrows of death have been released and the sorrows of hell. You remember reading in the book of Revelation that talks about death and hell and the grave? I believe chapter 21 it is in uh, regards to the white throne judgment and death and hell were forced to give up the dead, almost as if death and hell are beings, entities of darkness functions of the one evil devil. Something to speculate about. However, there were distinct times in my walk with God when I dealt with what I thought was depression, spirits of heaviness that have come upon me, Suddenly, I might add, and I didn't know what was wrong. It was as if a lens of darkness was placed in front of my eyes, as, as if someone took a bag and put it over my head, a bag of darkness, and suddenly I couldn't see what I saw before, and it brought fear. It's as if darkness flooded my mind, and I, was, I wasn't able to rejoice in the Scripture. The thought of Scripture was far from me. I could remember it, but there was no impact, if that makes sense. And I, I was wondering, what is this that I'm experiencing? Uh, am I struggling with depression? Why am I depressed? I know the word of God. Why doesn't that seem to register? And the Lord quickened me and said that in these particular times, they were spiritual attacks. Indeed, the sorrows of hell almost as if the sorrows of hell were a kind of weapon, were a kind of projectile. For example, like they had arrows that were named the sorrows of hell, arrows that were named the sorrows of death, and they would take these arrows and pew, pluck them at me, and I'd get hit all over with these arrows of the sorrows of death and hell. And suddenly everything became dreary and gloomy, and this kind of depression would set on me. I couldn't even call it depression because the feeling of it was magnified much, much greater than what I was normally accustomed to, almost as if I was buried and drowning in sorrow. Well, the Lord identified this to be the sorrows of death and the sorrows of hell. So this is an actual real spiritual concept that can come against a believer especially if you are trying to walk in faith, trying to walk in victory. This is a weapon of the enemy 
to try to make you afraid to bind you up so that you won't walk by faith anymore. However, by the spirit of the living God, who is light, we can overcome. It may be that we have to endure for a little while. That means don't give in to the stupid ideology and arguments presented by the sorrows of death or the sorrows of hell. The Lord just told me that somebody watching, at least one person, maybe two, I don't know, but someone watching, you are experiencing the sorrows of death and the sorrows of hell, and they've brought confusion to your mind because at one point you saw things one way and now suddenly there's been a sudden shift and the sorrows of death and the sorrows of hell have surrounded you in an attempt to try to stop you in your tracks. Let me just exhort you and tell you that this is a tactic of the enemy. I want you to pray against it and to continue to declare the word of God as it relates to your promise. Whatever it is that the sorrows of death are lying to you about, whatever it is that the sorrow of hell are lying to you about whatever picture they're trying to paint I want you to declare the opposite and remember the word of the Lord and begin to speak life out of your mouth don't let the sorrows of death influence your speech because the kingdom of God is within and the way that we get it out is through the faculty of our mouth speak life and watch the light take away the sorrows of death and hell. May you be quickened right now in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of the living God surround you and may the light of his glory shine so that you can see where you are. Recover in the name of Jesus. While we are praying here, it is fit I see to transition to the next book. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. I dictate to you in the King Jimmy version. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. When I imagine this in my mind, I picture a strong Jesus, not a feeble, weak, dainty, soft Jesus, as you may have seen portrayed in some imageries. No, I depict, I, I imagine a strong, masculine, manly, powerful Jesus overthrowing tables and scattering people. I imagine a growl on his face, a, Ah, you made my father's house into a den of thieves. Away with you. Man, there was nothing soft about our Savior. The Bible says, and overthrew the tables of the money. Overthrew, like he didn't just tip it over. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? He overthrew. I'm glad I didn't rip my shirt. Praise God. Woo my God, he overthrew them. I mean, can you imagine like one of those little, uh, <laughs> when you play those video games, those fighting games, and then they pull a special move and all of a sudden it's like this epic thing, like <laughs> that's what I imagine. Jesus overthrowing the tables and the money changers and the seats and all of them that sold doves, just something powerful, something epic. Someone ought to make a movie of that. Ah, perhaps Digital Disciple Ministries will one day own a production company and all of these dreams will turn into a reality. Verse 13 says this, And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it into a den of thieves. I have heard it said in messages that I've listened to that the reason why this or one of the reasons why this was 
such a bother to Jesus is because worship was made convenient. The sacrifice was made convenient. You see, they sold doves and other cattle there for people that wanted to worship and they would just go to the temple, trade in their money and get charged a little fee, kind of like banks do today, the banking system of this world. And then they would buy a sacrifice. They couldn't buy it with their currency. They had to change it out. So what they were doing was they were making sacrifice convenient. Scripture says bring an offering. So instead of traveling for a hundred miles with a bunch of cattle, you would just go to the temple and buy something. Convenient, fast food concept. But it robbed of the worship experience. And I have heard it said that this is one of the reasons that, why Jesus was upset. And it makes sense. Is your worship cheap? Is your worship convenient? What about your offerings? When you offer to God, is it convenient? Are you doing it out of convenience? Let me share with you something that is a personal conviction, something that the Holy Ghost showed me. I'm not saying that you need to do this. I'm not saying that if you don't do this, you're gonna die and go to hell and suffer forever. I'm not saying that. I'm sharing with you something that the Lord convicted me. This idea of convenient worship. One of the things is when it comes to giving an offering, I have become intentional. Now, a couple of times here lately, I have used my debit card. And uh, it was at one time that I didn't. It's so easy to just come and swipe. Well, no, not debit card. Okay, the credit card. I never use a credit card. You see some places that accept credit card offerings and you're giving money that you don't have. That's not, in my opinion, this is Brother Klaus, this is not the Bible. In my opinion, that's cheap. That's me though. It might be perfectly fine with you. And if you're doing it in faith, by all means, whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. But for me, from what my mind knows and from where my heart is shaped to me, that's unacceptable. And if I do that to God, then it, it, my, I'll be convicted. I'll be like, oh man, you know what? I came with a cheap offering. Also, God showed me how valuable it is or what it means to him when his children go out of their way. When I go out of my way to bring an offering, instead of doing it online or doing it on an app, which we have the capability to do so, I don't just go on the computer and tip, 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 boom, boom, I paid my offering. Let me rephrase that. I released my offering. I strongly dislike when people say, pay your tithes and pay your offering. That's incorrect terminology. You can only return a tithe. You can't pay somebody what is already theirs. So if you are giving tithes, you are returning a tithe. I emphasize this to me a lot. Father, I have come to return the portion that belongs to you. If you practice tithing, it's a principle. It was before the law. I encourage you to do it. In addition to that, I, I give offerings. I don't pay offerings. It's not something that I'm, I feel obligated to do. Offerings is something that I give willingly and of my free will. So I release the offering. I return the tithe and release the offering. And I like the way that sounds. And that's just me. I'm just giving a testimony of my experience with God. That's what I do. So I go out of my way or I try to go out of my way to bring an offering. The scripture says bring an offering. So I like to bring cash or maybe a check, but I don't use checks. Who uses checks still? Raise your hand. I can't see you. <laughs> Praise God. I use cash. I bring cash. And then I like what my church does. Um, in the evenings, in our evening celebration worship service, 
we are giving an, giving an opportunity to bring the offering. Instead of the plate coming around or the bag coming around and you just drop it in, we're giving an opportunity to come and to bring it to the front. I like that because it allows me to fulfill bring an offering. So I go out of my way to make sure I have cash and I have my little envelope so that I can bring an offering, returning the tithe and releasing an offering. And then whatever seed that I want to sow. Praise God. That was the Holy Ghost, I promise you, because that is not in my notes. <laughs> Let us go to Job. We are in chapter 19. Wow, 20 minutes. What doth happen to the time, Father? Okay, Job. Job 19, 1 through 3. This is Job speaking, and we are still in the same fiasco. I forgot to look at how many... Uh, by the way, I saw somebody mention or they looked up the word assuage. Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah, that was a sidebar. Let's go back to Job 19 verses 1 through 3. Job speaking. Same fiasco, same debacle going on here. Listen to what Job says. Then Job answered and said, How long will ye vex my soul? In my mind, the word vex is one of those stronger words. It's stronger than irritate. It's stronger than bother. Vex has that umph, that kick to it, that extra to let you know like, hey, I'm really being worked here. I am vexed. Like it's intense. That's just me. That's how I see the word. So it speaks different. You might not see that like that. So it speaks intensity about Job. I'm vexed in my soul and you are doing it. And he says, and break me in pieces with words. Do you know that saying? The ancient proverb of, I have no idea who came up with it or where it came from. But I'm sure that you all have heard it. Someone told it to you when you were a little kid because somebody else called you a bad name and your mommy or your daddy may have recited to you this little proverb. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie from the pits of hell. The devil conspired that argument to lie to kids so that they don't acknowledge pain. That is A dangerous thing. I was going to say dumb. Well, it's dumb too, but it's dangerous to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Words will break your heart. Job, look at Job and break me in pieces with words. Now, the Bible is a myth buster. Sticks and stones may break my bones and words will also break you. That's what the saying should be. Words will break your heart. I got, I got Bible. We all, we all read this. You all read this. You got Bible. We are in agreement. Words will break your heart. Words will shatter your soul. Somebody ever say something to you that just pierced right through you? I mean, it didn't get stuck a lot. It went all the way through. It ripped a hole open. I can remember one instance actually too, where someone's words pierced through my heart. I could tangibly feel my soul being injured and it changed my visage and countenance immediately. My whole mood shifted. Words can be fierce bullets that rip holes in you. These ten times have ye reproached me. Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourselves strange to me. You're supposed to be my, you're supposed to be my essays, my amigos, mi hermanos, mine freunde, mine kumpel. You know what I mean? And here you are barraging me. You're breaking me with your words. And it's just become so reoccurrent to me that these 
These humans are leaning on their own understanding. Job says in chapter 19, verse 8 and 9, this is him talking about God. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass. Do you ever feel trapped? Like the Lord has just locked you in? You can't make no move? I remember feeling like that when I was in the world. I was on the verge of coming back to the kingdom. I didn't know it then, but God was working. I had recently made some connections, some drug connections. I was getting drugs at really good prices, and I was very happy with these plugs. And then all of a sudden, suddenly, I couldn't get a hold of nobody. Nobody would answer the phone ever. And I'm like, yo, what's going on? Why can't I reach nobody? Leaving voicemails, text messages, nothing. Nobody responded. I would call people. They would hit me up. Yo, we're going to the club. Blah, 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 blah. Come scoop you. And then nothing. And I'm like, yo. And I knew. I said, God. I said, yo, you. I'm trying to make moves and you're blocking me in. Thank God that I was blocked in. But I was doing wrong here. Job is doing right, and he feels the same way. Oh, how great is the love of God. And he hath set darkness in my paths. God will bring darkness. It's not always the devil. Just because you have darkness in your life doesn't mean that the devil is working. It could be God. God creates darkness. He will let you roam around in darkness. It's just something that he does. Verse 9, he hath stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. And God will do that. Paul said, I count all these things dung. I counted at loss all my glory, all my accomplishments. I count them as dung. That's doo-doo. In another certain word that one might use to describe this Thing. nothing God stripped me of my glory my skills my abilities things I used to be good at all of a sudden what's going on with me I'm not good at it anymore I don't flow in that no more yeah God has stripped you of your glory and broken you down taken the crown from your head why because he aims to reveal his own glory in you Paul said Therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Your strengths may have been stripped away, weakened, broken off. And all you see is your weakness. It is so the king of glory can rest in you and manifest his power and his grace. Let him give you a crown of life. But he's going to take your crown first. All the things that you earned, that you did, God will take that from you. He'll help you. Praise God. So here we are, back to Zafar. They're taking turns. They're having themselves a little cipher here about who can beat down Job with their words. Now, Zafar isn't wrong. I've come to realize, like, hey, these people are not wrong in what they're saying. God does destroy the wicked. God does punish the wicked. They're just wrong in assuming that Job fits that description. Let's skip down to verse 29 of chapter 20. This is the portion of the wicked man from God and the heritage appointed unto him by God. Then he goes through all of these things. Coming back to verse 1. Then answered Zafar, the Naamath, uh, <clears throat> the Naaman, Naamathite, so far, the Naamathite, I want to say Neanderthal, but that's not what it says, the Naamathite, and said, therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer, and for this I make haste. I have heard the check of my reproach, and the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. There it is, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this he is leaning on his own understanding, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. They're not looking at it from a truth standpoint, but from their own understanding. And I read a comment earlier that said truth is ultimately what comforts us. I like that because it is. They're speaking falsehood. 
Not in the sense that what they're saying isn't true, but in how they're applying it to Job, that's not true. Look at number brr, four. Knowest thou not that this is that this of old, since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment? Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish forever. Like his own dung. They which have seen him, I don't know why I sung that. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? He shall not see the rivers, the floods, the brooks of honey butter, the promised land. They will not see the promised land. So what Zafar is saying is true, that God does deal with the wicked in that way, but his error is in applying this to Job and assuming that Job is wicked, as evident here by his confession, leaning on his own understanding. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, if ever we can learn a lesson from these characters here, it is that we shan't lean upon our own understanding, but let us always in all of our ways acknowledge him that he might direct our path. Peace be with you all and grace from God our Father and may the wind of the Spirit of God be at your backs and His face ever before you. Peace.